Well, good morning, everyone. Um, if you're watching this while you're sitting here in the sanctuary this morning, it means that the COVID that followed me back from Israel has not quite let go of me, and I am still testing positive. And so, having worked hard for three years to try to protect this congregation from illness and having told people who got COVID what they needed to do, it's now time for me to follow my own medicine. It's actually my first go-around with COVID. Kind of thought maybe I would miss it, but um, COVID continues to be that gift that keeps on giving. So you'll forgive me if I'm not here this morning. I hope uh, and fully anticipate I'll be back with you next Sunday, and I hope uh, things still work this morning in a little bit different format. Let's get started. Um, a, few, a week ago today, I sat down outside the Damascus Gate of the old city of Jerusalem. I actually did it to get off my aching feet for a few minutes, but honestly, in times I've been there before, I love sitting by this gate and just watch the fascinating parade of Palestinian Muslims and Christians, Orthodox Jews, tourists from all over the world the parade in and out, as they've done for centuries. While I was there, I was reminded of a time in 2015 um, when I sat in the same gate, and an older Muslim gentleman, in, in rather old-school garb, sat down next to me. He asked me, in somewhat faltering English, if I was a Christian. And I said I was. And then he started. You know, you Christians are wrong. Isa, and Isa is the Muslim name for Jesus, was a great prophet of Allah, but he was not God. You are all polytheists. And actually, I was surprised he got the word right. You are all polytheists to believe in three gods. There is only one God, and his name is Allah, not three. Esau was a man. That is all. Now, sitting at the main gate of the Muslim quarter, heavily armed Israeli police standing by, talking with an insistent but polite and non-threatening Muslim man, gentleman, I realized this was not the, the time and the place to try to win a theological debate. I tried to politely thank him for his thoughts and concerns, but insisted that I would hold on to my beliefs in the Trinity. But he kept going. And, and we did this for about five minutes until I thanked him for his thoughts and concerns. I, I wished him well with salam alaikum, peace be with you in Arabic, and left. Like many others, Islam believes that Jesus was no more than an inspired human teacher. And I might note that there are almost no faith groups that view Jesus negatively. They all seem to see him as, at the very least, a great moral teacher or some sort of prophet of God's word, but, but no more. Now that's fine in a sense, but it's a problem when there are Christians who believe the same thing. I know I started the series and then left for two weeks, but let me remind you that we are looking at select topics generated by the Ligonier Crossway State of Theology Report, a series of 35 questions of personal belief asked at the house, asked to thousands of participants. And as a part of the analysis, they were able to separate out the answers of Christians like us, not just all Christians, but evangelical Bible-believing committed to typical historic Christian belief Christians, like most of us are. So it was surprising to read question seven. Uh, to the general public, it was not. Uh, the question or the statement said, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Now, among the general public, 53% agree, which is not surprising. By the way, I have to say that, that I find that most non-Christians who say this have almost no real idea of what Jesus actually taught. But separate out the evangelical Christians, and you only find that 43% either agree or agree strongly. Uh, only 54% disagree. It's not quite evenly split, but close. Now, we're going to talk about how wrong that is in a bit. But let me also show you uh, something that's crazy. Question two of the report uh, states, there is one true God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
Well, that very same group of evangelicals agreed with that statement with a 97% affirmation rate. Only 2% disagreed. So do the math and ask yourself, how is it that nearly 45% of the people who affirm this also affirm that Jesus is only a great teacher but not God? Well, that's nuts, right? And I'll talk a bit about that as my closing thought. Let me take this head on to start. I could quote all sorts of scriptures that make it very clear, especially in the New Testament, that the New Testament witness sees Jesus as both fully divine and fully human. But you probably know that I especially love Colossians, and let's read from chapter 1. This part of chapter 1, Paul is probably, I think, quoting a hymn of the early church, which just goes to show how widespread this understanding was. So Colossians 1, verse 15 through 20. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And then Paul caps this off again in chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For again, chapter in verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now friends, let me suggest that nowhere in the Bible is so much of such great importance said in such a short space. And friends, let me just say, if in the last 23 years you have learned nothing from me, I would ask that you would learn today what Paul teaches here, because it's that important. When the Colossians first learned about Jesus, they had little to work with. No New Testament, no church history, no creeds or confession. But they did have a whole culture around them that had their own religious ideas and constructs. And without a doubt, the Colossian Christians must have tried to flesh out who Jesus was by looking for answers to these other religions. Paul worried that they were sliding dangerously into error. Perhaps they thought Jesus was just another angel created by God. Perhaps the greatest angel uh, created by God or the head of the angels, you know, who, who then visited to bring God's message. I mean, after all, angel simply means messenger. Was Jesus not the messenger of God's love? And to this, Paul fulls his, turns his full attention, delivers six verses that powerfully tell the Colossians who Jesus really is and where he stands in the nature of all things. Jesus is not just an inspired teacher, not just some sort of super angel. In a way that is hard for us to get our heads around then and now, he simply says, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Everything that God is, Christ also is. Now, the greatest debates of the early church were how to really understand this. Christians didn't want to become polytheists, but they clearly knew that the New Testament taught Jesus was just as much God as the Father was. And eventually this was clarified and codified in the Nicene Creed, the single great statement of belief and agreement of all Christianity. It begins and in part reads, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and visible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. 
For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven to become incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, was made human, was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And by the way, the broadest and most common answer to what you must believe to be a Christian is, is this creed. And then, yes, it's a problem if 43% of evangelical Christians can't fully embrace this. By the way, a side note here. Question 6 states, Jesus is the first and the greatest being created by God. And it is a huge problem that 70% of, of evangelical Christians agree with this. Again, the Colossians passage does say, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. Now in that line and in other places of scripture, firstborn simply refers to his role as the primary heir of all things from his father. For immediately after that, we're told that Jesus was the creator of all things. Jesus is not a creation of God in the same way anything else is created because that would make him lesser than God. And while it's probably impossible for us to fully grasp God's eternal nature, Jesus is described as a begotten son, never a creation of God in the same way that all other things were created. The Trinity existed eternally. And we ought to know that. Because if Jesus was just a creation of God, even if he is God's greatest creation, everything we understand about who God is and how we have been saved by God himself coming down in human form is therefore wrong. And let me tell you, this is not, you know, the how many angels can dance on the head of a pen question. The wrong answer changes everything. John was very clear about that in the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It's not just a Pauline idea. It runs through the New Testament. And I would like to think that so many Christians answered that question positively, incorrectly, because somehow they may have thought that it meant or or not understood what it meant or, or thought it through, but because they were, you know, thinking, well, maybe somehow this honors Jesus, without thinking what the consequences of it really were. Uh, it will not surprise you that I think a big problem is that we no longer think theologically and, and have not spent much effort using the tools, like catechisms, that, that help us to form our theological thinking. You know, question 20 in the New City a a Catechism asks, who is a redeemer? What's the answer? The only redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty of sin himself. Now, if Jesus is eternal, he's not created, is he? If you knew that and understood that and embraced that, you could not affirm a statement that makes Jesus simply a creation of God. <coughs> Let me start to wrap things up here with, with two final thoughts. I think the basic problem is that we are increasingly living in a world where our beliefs and our opinions are primarily based on short, pithy sayings, not intelligent, reasoned, comprehensive conversations, or even modest, diligent research. We're not bringing them out of the Bible. We're listening to what other people say in short phrases about the Bible. And frankly, I think we are running the risk of becoming Christians whose faith is defined by Facebook means, not diligent study. We're suckers for something that sounds good and not very good at thinking through the issue before we mentally click like. One commentator who looked at this study we're looking at said this. The main problem highlighted by the survey is growing nominalism and formalism within evangelicalism, which includes people who attend church, at least sometimes, 
but who are not really committed to its teachings. We may tend to think that evangelical churches are filled with Bible-believing Christians, and there may have been times in history when that was true, but it is not now. It is increasingly obvious from the survey that many people in evangelical churches have only a superficial awareness of what Christianity actually believes. Less frequent church attendance and lack of commitment to the local church compound the problem. And I think he's right. And friends, this morning, one final thought. And I have said this before, that, that we do seem to live in an age where we believe that one person's opinion, one person's personal truth, is just as good as the next. And, and I will tell you, that is not just true for religion. It's true for a lot of things. We live in an age of, of skepticism of anything other than our own personal opinions. Let me tell you, friends, if, if, if you think that's you, I hate to break it to you, but you're not that smart. And you know what? Neither am I. Hopefully, everything I tell you from this pulpit has been the product of 2,000 years of Christianity, 66 books of the Bible, countless thoughts and research from wise men and women, from St. Augustine to John Calvin to Tim Keller, to Rebecca McLaughlin, and a thousand more besides. Confessions like Westminster and Heidelberg and, and the great reform tradition we follow in. I honestly have had it, added nothing to that which I have been given. And I've done that because the gospel has not changed. I get that you pay me to do this, and I understand that makes it easier for me than for you. And I also know that on the day that I stand before God, I will not be judged by what's in my head, but who is the Lord of my heart, and by whose grace I have been forgiven. But I also need to know who the Lord is, and what he has done. And so do you. For nearly two weeks, almost every doorway I entered in Israel had something attached to the frame. It's, it's called a mezuzah. Uh, there is one actually on the frame of my office door. Jews kiss their fingers and touch it every time they enter or leave the doorway. And they recite the words that are written on it or in it. And they are the words of Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you shall be in your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You will bind them as a sign on your hands. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So friends, I ask you, what's in your head and your heart every day of your life? Let's hope that it's the right Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have not left us alone in this world, that you have loved us, you have sought us, you have taught us, you have died for us, and you have made it very, very clear that you're not just a good man, that you didn't come here to leave us with some good thoughts or or good ideas, that you are the very God of all existence, poured down into humanity to live and teach and ultimately to die for us in our place on the cross, that you might rise from the grave to show us that there's nothing that can conquer the power of a loving God. Help us to never see you as anything less than that, and help us to live our life as if that was true. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.